Future Hacker Life Path Future. Welcome back, everybody. This is the international edition of Future Hacker with your host, Maria Taichi. We are interviewing Monica. That's the third episode. So let's move on. A lot of interesting things going on. Make sure you listen to the first and the second one before getting into that. So, Monica, you introduced me to an entirely new subject, which is synthetic biology, a field of science that involves redesigning organisms for useful purposes by engineering them to have new abilities. So basically, we can program those organisms to produce something or gain a new ability. And that sounds so cool. So could you please just give us some examples of those uses in practical? And how far do you think this is headed? You mentioned to me it could even be used to create an entire virus like polio from scratch. And we could even be talking about biological weapons here. How could we possibly have controls in place to avoid something so hard to be detected, especially in countries with fewer regulations and safeguards? Sure, I'm glad we can talk about that field because it's really, truly fascinating. Indeed, synthetic biology involves redesigning organisms uh, for useful purposes by engineering them to have new abilities. Uh, and globally, synthetic biology researchers are harnessing the power of nature to solve broad range of problems in medicine or manufacturing or agriculture. They are redesigning those organisms so they can produce, for example, substance like a medicine or fuel or gain new ability like sensing something in the environment. Or, for example, there are uh, microorganisms harnessing the bioremediation to clean pollutant from uh, water, soil and air. Rice was actually uh, modified to produce beta-carotene, which is a nutrition usually associated with carrots that prevents vitamin A deficiency. And this is a great idea because the vitamin A deficiency causes blindness in half a million children every year and greatly increases the risk of premature death from infections. Scientists also manage uh, to engineer yeast uh, to produce rose oil, which is just eco-friendly and sustainable substitute for a real roses uh, that uh, you know are used in perfumes and luxury scents. In some ways, synthetic biology is a very similar to another approach. It's called gene editing, but they are, you know, they are different. It, they both involve changing the organism genetic code. However, in synthetic biology, scientists typically stitch together longer stretches of DNA and insert them onto the organ's genome. And those uh, are synthesized pieces of DNA that are found in other organisms or they could be entirely novel. For the gene editing, um, scientists typically use uh, smaller stretches of DNA and they make smaller changes to the DNA. And as you mentioned, 18 years ago, uh, because the viral geno genome is uh, you know, significantly smaller comparing to uh, most bacteria and microorganisms, the scientists synthesized a, a first viral genome. It was in 2002. And that was a poliovirus. And obviously, you know, uh, when scientists created that poliovirus uh, from scratch, they brought attention to the risk that synthetic biology could be used uh, as a biological weapon. While obviously that group of researchers didn't intend to cause any harm, those concerns that actors may use the synthetic biology for malicious purposes, they, they just, you know, increase in a, in, in, a, in a society. US, we have a further regulation to play uh, in place to regulate so-called dual use research or concern or research that could be directly misapplied to pose a significant threat to public health and safety or agriculture corps, plants, animals, environment or national security. Despite those concerns, today researchers are continually pushing the limits of existing DNA synthesis And they just help us to, you know, to help us understand how genomes works. So there is one significant group of researchers called Genome Project Right, GP Right, uh, which were created in, I think, 2016. Uh, and they are seeking to synthesize the whole genome of human cell lines and uh, also uh, genomes of plants and animals 
important in agriculture and public health. Since I am in the pharmaceutical sector, I need to mention that uh, synthetic biology is driving significant advances in biomedicine, uh, which uh, will lead to transformational improvement in healthcare. Already, uh, the patients are benefiting from so-called CR, which is CAR, states for chimeric antigen receptor. This is an engineered T cell. It's engineered to recognize, to, you know, to, it goes back to patient body and recognize and attacks cancer cells. Another example is the genetically engineered viruses, uh, which are used to correct defective genes. For example, in patients with inherited diseases, such as severe combined, a severe combined immunodeficiency. It's also used in work on new vectors who are able to deliver large genetic loads to target tissues and produce more efficient therapeutics and vaccines that will have fewer side effects and smaller risk of resistance. Furthermore, optimizing antibody or vaccine production, or example, uh, so they are in edible format, uh, because many people we don't know, but plants are really an alternative production platform for vaccines. And that could gener- greatly reduce the cost of increase, the speed of vaccine production in, uh, in any epidemic. We can see a genetically engineered peaks uh, to be virus resistant or have human-like immunoprofiles, which will allow us to transport organs from pigs to humans. And engineering of the microbiome is expected to lead development of also synthetic probiotics. As much as it all, it all is very exciting, indeed, all those projects that propose to synthesize entire genomes raise important ethical questions about potential harms and benefits to our society. Many of those ethical questions are relevant to synthetic biology, uh, are really similar to ethical questions related to genome editing uh, that we already discussed. So are human crossing moral boundaries by redesigning organisms? If synthetic biology creates new treatments for diseases, who in our society will have access to them? What are the environmental impacts? Because we are producing completely new organisms. So such ethical questions have been a subject of research and will continue to be researched uh, as te- technology evolves and uh, changes. Uh, most scientists and policymakers agree that entire societies must discuss the weight of those potential harms and benefits. In order to answer these questions, the public engagement dialogue in the governments of emerging synthetic energy and genome editing technologies is very critical Uh, not only now, but also in the future. So Monica, let's try to be a little creative here and imagine 20, 30 years into the future. So do you think we will ever be able to completely eliminate the testing of new drugs on human and animal subjects? Will we be able to rely only on computer simulations Is it something you could leave it up to AI and robotics and machine learning and quantum computer power to test those new drugs, shortening the farmer life cycle from decades to just a couple of months? So what's your thought on that? Uh, Yeah, so throughout our whole conversation today, I emphasize the, the importance of collaborations and partnerships in life science sector. In next 20 or even 30 years, We'll be still relying on another type of partnerships, and I believe this will be between human experts and machines. Uh, majority of AI and robots we are currently use are designed to perform narrow tasks, and it's plausible that you know one can create an artificial version of so-called natural general intelligence, which will be mimicking human mind. But the broad consensus is that really, most likely, this is many decades away. Discussion uh, we should be having now should be focused really around the more important current things uh, in AI, like data bias and making sure policymakers are catching up with the innovation. Data privacy and ownership are also very important and broad education, demystify the new technologies and make them less scary to facilitate broad adoption and acceptance by society is also very critical. There should be also a separate debate if something really special happens like true general intelligence that will be able to replace humans, which indeed 
has very profound and revolutionary imp- implications. This is not something uh, on this horizon. I still need to rely, we still need to rely heavily on brilliant minds of scientists and innovators who are as critical to our future as the technology they create. And, and some of the extravagant predictions being made about AI and revolutionizing drug discovery might be, you know, they may turn out to be overblown. Critics, you know, point out that there's a, there are commercial interests in play and that, at least for now, we don't have approved AI developed drugs. Will not last very long because over the next three to five years or so, the truth will really come out with data. If by that time we, we create better drugs, which are faster and cheaper, then I believe then uh, AI will really take off. And independently from the future, one can be pretty sure that innovation and collaboration will play a central role in the life science sector for the next 20, 30 years. And that we will emerge with a wide range of technologies and revolutionary therapies that could not be accomplished without combining power of those diverse teams and artificial intelligence. Sounds great, Monica. There's a lot of great content, a lot of amazing information uh, that I do hope it will inspire our listeners to do their own research about it. So th- there were so many different subjects that we covered today. We talked about the pharma industry, the healthcare industry. We went to wearables, the synthetic uh, biology piece. So, you know, there's so much to be researched and discussed. When it comes to technology in pharma and in healthcare, the debate regarding ethics and regulations couldn't be more important. And I think that you probably mentioned that in almost every answer that you gave us today, right? On the same time, it's extraordinary and terrifying. And it has been playing with human imagination for such a long time, right? When you see all those movies about those subjects. But still, it's a debate, as you mentioned, that it must involve humanity as a whole. The rules and regulations, they must have everyone on board, right? Or it it would get very dangerous in the hands of a few, as you mentioned, the scientists uh, in China just bending the rules that, that are basically uh, were a common sense by that time. So having that said, so do you have any final comments for our listeners? The key danger from editing human embryos is that unintended of target DNA change that may occur and not be detected before embryo implantation. That being said, genome editing could be moved potentially from the lab to assisted reproduction intervention for human diseases. That cannot happen without further discussion on the social and ethical consideration at forums like World Health Organization. Also, country-level governments and international organizations or scientific committees should be establishing proper regulation and processes as the key, um, you know, they are critical to guide the scientific community and hopefully which are suppressing the innovation. So, Monica, uh, getting a little out of the script, uh, and I have to ask you that. Uh, We've been talking to a lot of people about, you know, the future, the future studies and unknowns of all those, you know, predictions of what will happen, what will not happen. And doing those researches, I learned about those two ways of seeing the future. You have the more pessimistic way of having the robots, as you also mentioned, you know, just replacing the humans and and actually outpacing our intelligence. And we have this other brighter side, which is humans developing in a more sustainable way, using renewable energy and having this integrated approach to science and to healthcare. So I I think I know your answer, the answers you gave me before, but do you consider yourself a more optimistic person related to the future or a more, you know, I, I don't like the word pessimistic, but, you know, let's say, do you have your constraints regarding what's next and what's out there? So, yeah, I think... You, you would guess that I'm really optimistic. Um, so I don't think, as I said, I don't believe AI or robotics are really a threat to humanity for simple reasons. 
Uh, we are really, really far away from the general intelligence. So what we have in hands are robots, uh, which are really far away from being like humans. And the mind doesn't, doesn't work the same way. They are focused on narrow tasks when, you know, the general intelligence is still the domain of humans. And that's going to remain for a long, long time. We should look at uh, AI in a very, very different way because AI and implementation of AI actually brings a lot of new jobs on the market as well. Um, you know, you need data scientists, you need to, you need to, and big organizations are already, already doing it. Uh, big companies are thinking about the future and how to uh, utilize and retrain their employees so they, uh, they are not jobless, but they can actually work hand in hand with robots and artificial intelligence at large and form partnerships. And I really strongly believe that partnership is the future. I don't think we are going against the robots. I'm not pessimistic like Elon Musk, which is famous because he was he was the one saying that this is, you know, the AI means a doom day for that for us or for humanity. We because you know we are going to stri- strictly follow the Matrix movies which I don't believe is true. I think there will be partnerships and human minds is not replaceable. Human expertise is not replaceable and it's not going to be replaceable for the next 30 years, it's at least. Monica, it was such, such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, Maria. It was a pleasure to be your guest at Future Hacker. Awesome. Have a great time, everybody. Thanks a lot. And this is the last episode for Monica. And thanks a lot for listening to Future Hacker, everybody. Future Hacker. Life. Path. Future. Future.